This is the SD to IEC, and when set up correctly can load certain programs faster than any Jiffy DOS or Epix Fastload cartridge, all on a stock Commodore 64. So today we're going to look at how to set this up the best possible way, and we'll also look at how to copy to and from an actual floppy disk using just this device. Right, so before we dive in using this on the Commodore 64, I'm actually gonna set up the SD card. Uh, now there are a few guidelines and tips and tricks that I wish I had known when I first set up my SD to IEC, but we'll go through them now. We'll start from scratch. So the first thing you want is to format the SD card as FAT32. Uh, I'll just do another quick format just to make sure. Cool, and now that that's all done, we're just gonna go and grab CBM File Browser. Now, I'll leave links to all the programs that I use down in the description, uh, but for now, we're just gonna download this one and open up our zip file, look under Programs, and we just wanna extract FB, just that one file, and stick it on our SD card. So now we should have just FB on our SD card. Now the reason I've put that first is because when you put it in the Commodore 64, it lists everything by the order that you put them on the SD card and not necessarily alphabetical order. So if you wanna load star, it's gonna load the very first thing that you copied onto the SD card. In this case, we want it to be FB. After that, I'm actually gonna create some directories on here. Uh, because I want them to show up pretty much at the top of the file browser list. So I'm going to have one for Commodore 64 stuff. And because the SD to IEC also works on other Commodore machines, I'll have one just for 128 stuff. Uh, we might do one for the 264 or TED series of computers. And of course, one for the VIC-20. Now notice that I'm using all lowercase letters and the reason for that is because it needs to be translated from ASCII on a computer to Petsky on the Commodore 64. And if you use uppercase ASCII, that's gonna look the same as using shift and whatever um, letter on a Commodore 64. So if you use uppercase here, you're gonna see uh, a bunch of weird looking symbols rather than capital letters. So now that we've got the folders there, we can add files to them later on. The next thing we wanna do is copy the rest of those file browsers uh, over to the SD card. Now, of course, if you only ever plan on using this on a Commodore 64, you can pretty much leave off any of the other file browsers if you don't wanna copy them over, or you can bring them over later on. The important thing is to have that FB file first. All right, so all of our file browser files are there. Now this is for CBM file browser. The one that I actually recommend using is called FB1K. Now the reason for that is it seems to be a little bit more compatible and it's also a hell of a lot faster. Uh, it has a feature called SJ load, which uses some Jiffy DOS routines. I don't fully understand how it works, uh, but it certainly speeds up loading even on a stock C64. So we're gonna grab FB1K version 1.1 and we'll download this. And once again, we're just gonna move that to our SD card. Now what we're gonna do before we put this in the Commodore 64, I'm actually gonna use a hex editor to change the FB program. Now HXD is a popular one and it's free to download, so I'll Again, put links to that in the description. And we're just gonna open up FB with HXD. And if we scroll down near the end of the file, you can see the file names of the various file browsers down here. Now, as I said, we don't wanna use CBM file browser, not by default anyway. So I'm actually gonna change this to FB1K, where it said FB64. Save that and we can close the hex editor and it will put, why is this not auto updating? I don't know. It will put a backup file if you ever wanna go back to that. But now when we load star, that's gonna load FB because it's the first thing we put on the SD card. FB is gonna detect that it's running on a C64 
And instead of running FB64, it's gonna run FB1K. Let me show you what that looks like. All right, so we'll just load star comma eight. Run, it's gonna say CBM file browser, but it'll drop us into hopefully FB1K. Now this is what it looks like but by default. Uh, you can actually change the color scheme and I do prefer uh, my own color scheme. So this is what it looks like. It's very similar to the um, CBM file browser, uh, but it loads everything a hell of a lot quicker. So before we play around with that, let's just change this color scheme a little bit. So if we have a look in the readme file that was provided with FB1K, uh, it does list some of the features and the controls. One of the only downsides of this is it doesn't work with a joystick. Uh, the CBM file browser also has a way to use it with the joystick. This one doesn't, but most of the time, if you've just turned on your Commodore 64 and are loading something up, chances are you're gonna be sitting right in front of the keyboard anyway. So not a huge deal. But what they do list uh, is how to change the default colors and what each one of those means. Let me just show you the default colors that I prefer. And I've got them already in a text file here. So, Again, we're going to go to our SD card. This time we're going to open up FB1K in our hex editor. And again, scrolling to the end of that file, somewhere just around here, let's go back and look at the readme file. So starting from byte 88C uh, is our GUI ink color. So these here are the default values. These over here are my preferred values. So let's change them. So starting with 88C, which is you can see down here, offset 88C, we're gonna have 01, and then it just moves on to 88D. So 06, 00, 0F, 0D, 01, 0C, 05. That should give us in my opinion, a better color scheme, but it's nice that the developers actually put this in there so you could easily change it, as long as you're not scared of a hex editor. Cool, let's pull that back out and see what it looks like on the Commodore this time. And there we go. So to me, that's just a little bit more pleasing to the eye. Uh, obviously the green stuff is actual directories and pretty much everything else is like a file. While we're here, let's just compare that to FB64, which is still on our SD card. And that's what FB64 looks like. Um, so I guess it's kind of mimicking the color scheme of FB64. Now that that's all done, I'm gonna throw a few programs on the SD card and uh, we'll do some speed tests, benchmarks, whatever you wanna call them. All right, so as you can probably tell, it's the next day and I spent some time setting up the SD card and also running a bunch of benchmarks. So let's jump straight in and take a look at the results. First up, we've got 007, The Living Daylights. This is just a regular PRG file. 49,000 bytes, 195 blocks. So on the top left, we've got a stock Commodore 64 using FB64. Bottom left, we've got the same 64 using FB1K. In the middle, we've got Jiffy DOS, which is the C64 that's on the bench in front of me at the moment using FB64. And on the bottom right, we've got an Epix fast load cart with FB64. Now that's the cartridge and SD to IEC that I showed in a previous video. Um, so let's run the bench and see what happens. So the first one to load was the stock Commodore 64 using FB1K. 
That loaded in 4.84 seconds for a bitrate of about 10,194 bytes per sec. So that's about 10K per second. Uh, Jiffy DOS was close behind it at 5.44 seconds for about 9K a second. And the Epix wasn't far behind that at seven seconds for about 7K per second. Now the stock C64 with FB64 is currently still loading and uh, that is going to take a while. So what I didn't include here was using Jiffy DOS with FB1K or the Epix fast load with FB1K because they both resulted in the same speed as the stock C64 with FB1K. So 4.84 seconds. So if you're using FB1K, regardless of what other modifications you have, it's always going to be that that maximum speed basically and any moment soon the stock c64 should finally load up now you'll notice that i also didn't load fully into the game this is just the loading part uh it still does a little bit of decompression after this bit once it's all loaded and there we go the stock c64 with fb64 took 98.11 seconds for an average speed of about 500 bytes per second. So yeah, typical stock Commodore slow ass performance. All right, so let's run the same test, just loading up a directory. Now this one has 733 files in it, so it is quite large. Let's see what our results are. So FB1K has come out at 5.72 seconds. Uh, Jiffy DOS followed closely behind with 7.92 seconds. And a bit of an odd one with this one because the stock C64 and the Epix fast load cart both ended up taking the same amount of time. Something we'll notice while we wait for the other two to finish loading. Um, some of the file names in there are, look a little bit corrupted. Now, what I should have mentioned before is it's best to stick to a 12.3 file name format. So 12 characters followed by .prg or .d64. Um, the FB64 and also FB1K don't support file names longer than that. So a maximum of 16 characters, including the extension. I'd recommend just sticking with alphanumeric stuff or lowercase and dashes and pluses and spaces are okay, but uh, try and avoid any other special characters. So we can now see that the stock C64 and the Epix fast load both took 48.88 seconds. So again, FB1K is the clear winner, followed closely by Jiffy DOS. In this case, the Epix fast load didn't make a difference, um, but that's no reason to go throwing away your Epix fast load cart just yet. Let's have a look at what a multi-load game will look like. So this is a game that would normally be on a disc and it would have the first file is just the loader, then it goes off and loads a bunch of other files after that. Let's check this one out. So at the start, they all look pretty quick, but notice that the Jiffy DOS and the Epix fast load have pretty much already finished loading the game. In fact, now they have. You'll notice that the stock C64 with FB64 and FB1K very similar in performance. So FB1K is slightly faster but only just and that is simply because it'll load that first file really quick uh, but then the rest of the files after that will load at normal speed. I'm not going to bother putting up the times or the bit rates here because it pauses like on this thousand miler intro screen and all that kind of stuff so it's a bit hard to judge the actual bit rates that we're getting but yeah FB1K and FB64 are very similar in this case. And once we finally manage to load the full game, come on. So yeah, there's maybe half a second difference between those two. So 
Still good to have the Epix fast load cartridge, but in all cases, FB1K beats FB64. All right, let's talk about compatibility because the SD to IEC is notorious for being incompatible with a lot of software. That's not necessarily true, um, but you've got to keep in mind that the SD to IEC is not a disk drive emulator, uh, not like the Pi 1541. So, there is going to be some compatibility issues, especially with demos. Uh, but for the most part, I've found the SD to IEC will work with almost everything that I throw at it. Let me give you an example here and we'll use FB1K again. This is just a random program that I came across because it has a massive file size. I think it was like 244 blocks, which is like 60 kilobytes. Um, which is almost the whole memory size of the Commodore 64 itself. So this is oink. And loading it up with FB1K. It appears to load just fine. And, you know, I've even played it and it seems to work just fine. The odd thing is if we use FB64 to load it and keep in mind I also tested this on the stock Commodore 64 and not this Jiffy DOS enhanced one. Let's go down using FB64 loading so everything looks normal and then it just crashes. So for whatever reason using FB1K actually loads it correctly using FB64 does not. What's even more strange is I tried the same thing with the Pi 1541 and it also crashed when loading that particular program. So I don't know why it's working with FB1K and nothing else. I even copied it to an actual disk, tried to load it off that, crashed, copied that disk image back to the SD to IEC and loaded it, loaded it again just to be sure and it loaded with FB1K again. So um, compatibility is a little bit weird sometimes. All that being said, if you find a particular program that doesn't work, uh, you've pretty much got three options. First one I'd suggest is looking for another version of that particular program. Chances are if one doesn't work, you may be able to find another one that does. And I can, I've even got a demonstration of that. So. So I acquired another copy of Oink. And if we load this one with FB64, looks like it's decompressing or something, but at least it appears to be doing something. Pretty sure this one's got a bunch of trainers and crap attached to it as well. Yeah, there we go, there's crack tro and stuff. No, just want a normal game. And there we go. So this one loaded with FB64, but for whatever reason, the other copy I've got doesn't want to. So that's the first option, find another copy. Second option, of course, if you've got one, is the Pi 1541. If you don't have one, definitely look at the Pi 1541 plus Epix fast load. So it's very similar to the uh, SD to IEC plus Epix fast load that I showed building in the last one. Uh, I think Mr. Lurch, AKA Jason, has done a video on the Pi plus Epix fast load cartridge. Uh, I'll see if I can find that and put a link down in the description if you want to check that out. And of course, the third and final option if you've got one, is using a real disk drive, either a 1541 or a 1541 .2. And we can create actual disk images or actual disks from the SD to IEC. So you don't need anything else. You do just need, however, a little bit of software uh, to stick on the SD card of your SD to IEC. So let me just plug this in. Before I do that, let's put
put this software on our SD card. So for copying files to and from an actual disk drive to the SD to IEC, I recommend SD Browse version 4EC. There is another version called 697 and I've found that to be quite buggy. So I recommend just going with version 4EC. So we'll download this one and all we want from the zip file is sdb the si file appears to just be like a fast loader for the sdb program so given that we've already got some pretty speedy fast loading with um fb1k we won't worry about it and i'm just going to stick sdb on our memory card which is falling apart here Anyway, so we're ready to copy to and from actual disks. The only little thing we need to do is change one of these device numbers. So at the moment, both of these things are set to device eight. Now this particular SD to IEC didn't have a device switch. It is possible to change this in the command line or Commodore basic or whatever by typing in a bunch of crap, but I actually cracked this thing open and added my own device switch. The SD to IEC firmware actually has a provision to switch the device number, but for whatever reason, they just left it out of this little one. So I got in there, soldered a few wires and with a little bit of super glue, I've now got a little switch on my SD to IEC so I can switch through device numbers. The other option is switching the disk drive device number. Now for the 15412, it's simple because it again has little switches, but for a regular 1541 there's no switches you have to open it up and either bridge a little connection on the actual circuit board or potentially add your own switches but i don't recommend making a new hole in your 1541 if there wasn't one there already um, but totally up to you of course the sdic and epics fast load does have switches well this one does the regular one had jumpers but I like switches so that's what I changed it to um, but let's just say that you don't have any switches available to you at all there are a couple of commands that we can send to the SD to IEC to change its device number so we want to open a channel um, to the device which is 15 comma 8 comma 15 and then we're going to print at that channel the device number that we want to change it to. I'll um, possibly put this down in the video description as well if you want to do the same. Or you can just pause the video here and copy what I've done. So those two commands should now have set the SD to IEC as device number nine. And yes, we can see that that is device number nine. If I try and load device number eight, it's no longer there. So yeah, that's how you can do it in software, but you're gonna have to do it every time you turn on and off the Commodore 64. So switches are a little bit more convenient for that. Let's change the device number on the SD to IEC. Plug that in and plug the serial connection into the disk drive along with power and of course serial from the disk drive back to the Commodore. Now if I've done this right the disk drive should be device 8. SD to IEC should now be set to device 9 thanks to those switches and device not present if I turn the disk drive on. Let's just try that again. All right, so it's device eight. There's no disk in there, so it's having a bit of a whinge. And device nine is our SD to IAC. Cool. Let's throw in a disk and we'll load up that SDB program. I might just load it from here while it's here. Oh. Now, JiffyDOS, 
using those shortcuts will automatically try and load device eight. So that's not gonna work. Let's load SDB comma nine. Of course I could have done this through the file browser, but either either. Right, so this is SDB. You can press F1 for help, and I recommend you do so because that's gonna show you all the keys that you need to use to navigate this program. I'm not gonna go through all them here. Um, you can do the reading for yourself. What we're gonna do is change the second drive, so the one on the right-hand side, to device eight. And it looks like I've already put a program on here. That's okay, we're gonna overwrite that anyway. So with this, you can either copy single program files. Um, it is quite a lot slower for some reason to copy single program files, or you can copy full D64 disk images, which is what we're gonna do. So let's find something that doesn't work on the SD to IEC. Uh, for instance, a demo. Uh, let's go with Bromance. Actually, I think that's what's already on the disk, but we'll copy it over again. So this should copy. It's warning me that disk is going to be erased. This is going to copy the D64 image from our SD card over to an actual floppy. Again, uh, have a look in the help file for all the keyboard commands because it's kind of confusing to explain, um, but you get used to them fairly quick. Now, although this machine has Jiffy DOS, the actual disk drive does not have Jiffy DOS installed. So this is the speed you're gonna get on a stock Commodore 64. The SD browse program also has some fast loading and saving routines it would seem. So yeah, it doesn't take very long to take a disk image and put it on an actual disk, which is pretty neat. Of course, when you load off that disk, if you don't have Jiffy DOS in your Commodore 64 and your disk drive, then you're pretty much back to the slow load routines. Not sure if that was a actual error. The device did the, um, the head banging, the banging of the head. So that's not supposed to happen. Maybe this is a bad disc and that's why I put it aside. Something's not right with that. this disk will be erased. There's nothing on it anyway. All right, so no idea what was going on there. I restarted the Commodore and it copied okay this time. So we can see that on the right hand side is device eight, which has our disk in it. And on the left, we've still got device nine, which is the SD to IEC. And they look to match. So that's side one of this. I'm not gonna copy over side two. I'll give you an idea of what it looks like to copy actual programs over. So I'm just gonna reselect device eight just to refresh it. And we can see that it's blank. Let's copy over a file. Uh, let's, let's say a random utility that's pretty small. I think this one's quite small, copy. All right, there we go. And we'll copy something else just for fun. So you can see that it's pretty slow, only 14 blocks, but that's pretty slow for um, writing a program file. Keep in mind that like the disk image that we copied was 664 blocks and that was pretty quick in comparison. Um, so yeah, there you go.
actual program files on our disk. Obviously we can throw more of them on there if we really wanted to. Um, but you can also copy program files off a disk back onto the SD to IEC. Let's do that. Might just back out here and we're going to swap these two devices around. Uh, we might just put them in this area. So file copy, reads it off the drive, writes it to the SD to IAC, and there it is. Of course, if you had Jiffy DOS in your 1541 drive, this would be a lot faster, but it's not too bad. And if we wanted to, we can make an entire disk image of this disk. Uh, let's just call it utils, because that's kind of what I put on there. And once again, copying a full disk uh, is actually quite quick. Obviously, when copying a full disk, we're also copying all that blank space as well, but still, it's pretty quick. And we can see that we now have a utils.d64, which is an exact copy of this disk. So you, there you go, that's how you copy to and from an actual disk drive, both with program files and full disk images. Let's uh, test it out to be sure. And I might unplug the SD to IEC for this. So yeah, there's the files on side B and on side A should be our bromance demo. Obviously this will work on a Pi 1541, but will not work on any SD to IEC device. Let's do it. So I think that's all I had to show. Um, hopefully this helped you out if you've got one of these devices or are considering getting one. Um, yeah, FB1K for your file browser. SDB version 4ED or whatever it was, if you want to copy to and from actual disks. This is a very good demo, I recommend checking this one out. Obviously I didn't copy side 2 of this, so I can only get halfway through it. But yeah, I have seen the whole thing and it's worth a watch. So um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video, um, the stats for nerds, uh, if it's helped you out, um, consider supporting the channel, links to Patreon and YouTube channel memberships are in the description somewhere, this is very distracting as well, and um, yeah, otherwise share it around, subscribe, like the videos, whatever you can do to sort of get this channel out there and uh, I'll be able to continue making videos like this one. So um, until next time, thanks for watching the Retro Channel. Massive thanks to the people that support. And yeah, I can get my groove on. I think this demo is designed for an 8580 SID and there's a 6581 in here. So probably doesn't sound as good as it could. Definitely funky. Yeah, rub some funk on it. Channel your inner Adrian.